March 17th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Numbers chapters 35 and 36 from the Old Testament. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the Moabite plains by the Jordan near Jericho. He said, Instruct the Israelites to give the Levites towns to live in from the inheritance the Israelites will possess. You must also give the Levites grazing land around the towns. Thus they will have towns in which to live, and their grazing lands will be for their cattle, for their possessions, and for all their animals. The grazing lands around the towns that you will give to the Levites must extend to a distance of 500 yards from the town wall. You must measure from outside the wall of the town on the east 1,000 yards, and on the south side 1,000 yards, and on the west side 1,000 yards, and on the north side 1,000 yards, with the town in the middle. This territory must belong to them as grazing land for the towns. Now from these towns that you will give to the Levites, you must select six towns of refuge to which a person who has killed someone may flee, and you must give them 42 other towns. So the total of the towns you will give the Levites is 48. You must give these together with their grazing lands. The towns you will give must be from the possession of the Israelites. From the larger tribes you must give more, and from the smaller tribes fewer. Each must contribute some of its own towns to the Levites in proportion to the inheritance allocated to each. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, When you cross over the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, you must then designate some towns as towns of refuge for you, to which a person who has killed someone unintentionally may flee. And they must stand as your towns of refuge from the avenger in order that the killer may not die until he has stood trial before the community. These towns that you must give shall be your six towns for refuge. You must give three towns on this side of the Jordan, and you must give three towns in the land of Canaan. They must be towns of refuge. These six towns will be places of refuge for the Israelites and for the foreigner and for the settler among you so that anyone who kills any person accidentally may flee there. But if he hits someone with an iron tool so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer must surely be put to death. If he strikes him by throwing a stone large enough that he could die, and he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer must surely be put to death. Or if he strikes him with a wooden hand weapon so that he could die, and he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer must surely be put to death. The avenger of blood himself must kill the murderer when he meets him. He must kill him. But if he strikes him out of hatred or throws something at him intentionally so that he dies, or with enmity he strikes him with his hand and he dies, the one who struck him must surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The avenger of blood must kill the murderer when he meets him. But if he strikes him suddenly without enmity or throws something at him unintentionally or with any stone large enough that a man could die without seeing him and throws it at him and he dies, even though he was not his enemy nor sought his harm, then the community must judge between the slayer and the avenger of blood according to these decisions. The community must deliver the slayer out of the hand of the avenger of blood and the community must restore him to the town of refuge to which he fled. And he must live there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the consecrated oil. But if the slayer at any time goes outside the boundary of the town to which he had fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the borders of the town of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the slayer, he will not be guilty of blood, because the slayer should have stayed in his town of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer may return to the land of his possessions. So these things must be a statutory ordinance for you throughout your generations, in all the places where you live. Whoever kills any person, the murderer must be put to death by the testimony of witnesses. But one witness cannot testify against any person to cause him to be put to death. Moreover, you must not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death. He must surely be put to death. And you must not accept a ransom for anyone who has fled to a town of refuge to allow him to return home and live on his own land before the death of the high priest. 
You must not pollute the land where you live, for blood defiles the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed there, except by the blood of the person who shed it. Therefore do not defile the land that you will inhabit in which I live, for I, the Lord, live among the Israelites. Then the heads of the family groups of the Gileadites, the descendants of Maker, the descendants of Manasseh, who were from the Josephite families, approached and spoke before Moses and the leaders who were the heads of the Israelite families. They said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land as an inheritance by lot to the Israelites, and my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of our brother Zelophehad to his daughters. Now if they should be married to one of the men from another Israelite tribe, their inheritance would be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. As a result, it will be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the Israelites is to take place, their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe in which they marry. So their inheritance will be taken away from the inheritance of our ancestral tribe. Then Moses gave a ruling to the Israelites by the word of the Lord. What the tribe of the Josephites is saying is right. This is what the Lord has commanded for Zelophehad's daughters. Let them marry whomever they think best. Only they must marry within the family of their father's tribe. In this way, the inheritance of the Israelites will not be transferred from tribe to tribe, but every one of the Israelites must retain the ancestral heritage. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance from any of the tribes of the Israelites must become the wife of a man from any family in her father's tribe, so that every Israelite may retain the inheritance of his fathers. No inheritance may pass from tribe to tribe, but every one of the tribes of the Israelites must retain its inheritance. As the Lord had commanded Moses, so the daughters of Zelophehad did. For the daughters of Zelophehad, Mala, Tirza, Hagla, Mikla, and Noah were married to the sons of their uncles. They were married into the families of the Manassehites, the descendants of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's family. These are the commandments and the decisions that the Lord commanded the Israelites through the authority of Moses on the plains of Moab by the Jordan River opposite Jericho. God, it's just amazing to watch your power and your care of the people of Israel. Here we've seen them go through quite a bit together, and we've seen them travel quite a distance. We've seen your love through discipline for them, um, as well as boundaries and commandments to stay within uh, so that they could live in your light. You chose to dwell among them. Uh, through the temple and now you're about to bring them into their promised land you're about to fulfill your covenant with their forefathers and even though I get really excited at this part we're about to go into uh, Deuteronomy uh, the fifth book in the Bible and we we know that there's kind of even though we're really excited about them moving into the promised land, we do know that there's kind of one bit of unfinished business, which means the man, Moses, who you have given all these instructions to and guidelines and, and has been the go-to person for, for Israel, um, doesn't get to see the promised land. And so we know, even though we're really excited that we're about to see them move into what you have promised to give them, we know that Moses doesn't get to go there. And that that will be the end of of our time with him in this story. God, I t today I, I just ask for prayers for the people listening. Some of them are the Israelites who are super excited about the direction of their life. Some of them are the Israelites who are whining and complaining. <laughs> Some of them are the Israelites who aren't obeying anything that you've asked them to do. And some of them feel like they have impending doom coming into their life. Discipline. Um, or even things that they don't see as good things coming into their life. 
I'm not sure if Moses ever saw it that way. Uh, at the point that you handed down that judgment against him, he was such an incredible man of God at that point. But I also know Moses was human. And I think even when we're being disciplined for good and we're being disciplined because you love us and those judgments are well deserved because we're sinful people. I think there's a little bit of humanness that happens there of frustration and calls out to justice. So no matter where the person who's listening to this, no matter where they are in their life, whether they're super excited in their walk with you right now, whether they're whining and complaining or not doing what you've asked them to do, or if they're in a period of discipline where you are trying out of love for them to help get them back on the right path, that they've made some wrong choices and now you've got to get them back on that path and, and set them straight. God, I just pray that no matter where they are, that they will realize that you are in charge, that you love them more than they will ever imagine in their entire life. That unlike the people of this world, the broken people of this world, you will never hurt them. You will never leave them. Forgiveness for all that they have done and even what they will do is built into your promises to us. Our promised land came with your son, Jesus Christ. When you had him murdered on the cross, for not only the forgiveness of our sins, the end of our death, and the ability to have eternal life with you. Many people listening to this may already be on their way to their promised land, may already know that they have eternal life with you. Some of the people listening may be questioning whether they even get to go into the promised land or not. And some of them are so adamant that they will never see the promised land that they just continue to rebel against you. God, I know that you want everyone to draw close to you. I know you want reconciliation to happen in relationships. I know that all you want to do is love these people. I also know without a shadow of a doubt that it is never, ever, never too late for a single person who is listening to your words right now. That at any single point, no matter what they have done in the past, no matter what, the worst of the worst, no matter what they have done in the past, that you, as our shepherd of grace and mercy, the second that they start to turn towards you, will open your arms to them with love and kindness and allow them to come back in. Or perhaps come in a, to the fold for the first time. God, I just want those emotions and those feelings and that security to just fill up their heart today. That no matter where they are, that you are there with them. Even if they think that they're really far away from you and they've pushed you away as far as they can. Today they need to understand that you're still standing right next to them. That there's not a single place in this world that we can run to get away from your grace and mercy, which is so crazy awesome. God, thank you for loving us in the way that you do. Thank you for our promised land, not only through your son, Jesus Christ, but for the eternity that we get to spend with you. We love you so much. In your son's name we pray. Amen.